Hello, everyone. We're just waiting for one or two more minutes for more people to join and we'll start shortly. All right, since we only have an hour, I would suggest we start and more people can join as we speak. So hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us today for this virtual roundtable on promises and pitfalls of accelerating SDG implementation and global governance. This roundtable is the first of a larger series that the SDG task force of the Earth System Governance Project is organizing in the coming months, and it is co-hosted by its working group on global governance. And before we start, I would like to let you know that we are recording this roundtable, as we would also like to share it with those who can't join us live. First, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Felicitas Fritscher. I'm a PhD researcher at Stockholm University. And together with Melanie Frangil, a PhD researcher at U Utrecht University, Christina Jönsson, associate professor at Lund University, and Gisa Sensoro, a PhD researcher at Newcastle University. I co-lead the working group on global governance and the SDGs. And this group has around 30 members who collaborate and exchange on research about the 2030 agenda and global governance. And I'm very happy to see many of them here today um, as both speakers and in the audience. And today we have five excellent international experts who will give us um, brief five minute long interventions based on their expertise on the theme of accelerating SDG implementation and global governance. And afterwards, we will have 30 minutes for questions and comments from the audience. And we would like to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions or comments while the speakers are presenting, feel free to put them into the chat. And my colleague Melanie will guide you through the Q&A session and will pick them up. And you can, of course, also raise your hand and join the discussion then. Also, feel free to share any upcoming relevant events or publications in the chat. And please mute yourself while you're not speaking. So 
let me briefly introduce our speakers now. Um, today we have Professor Pamela Chesek joining us. Uh, she is the chair of the political science department at Manhattan College and the co-founder and executive editor of the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, a long-standing reporting service on United Nations environment and development negotiations. We're also very happy to have Dr. Marianne Beisheim, who is a researcher and senior associate at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, short SWP, joining, who has researched on global governance for sustainable development with a focus on negotiations and institutions at the United Nations. We also have joining Maya Bojas, who's a PhD researcher um, on global sustainability governance within the Global Goals Project at Utrecht University where she has researched the effect of the SDGs on international organizations. And Dr. Samya Yoshi is also joining us today, who is the head of the unit on, um, on global agendas, climate and systems at the headquarters of the Stockholm Environment Institute in Stockholm. And she has previously been an associate professor in governance and sustainability at the Department of Computer and System Science at Stockholm University. And last but not least, we're very happy to have David O'Connor, who is the permanent observer at the United Nations of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, with us today. Um, he has previously also worked as chief of the policy and analysis branch of the Division for Sustainable Development at the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and we would like to discuss with you what you see as the promises and pitfalls of accelerating SDG implementation and global governance. And as you know, the SDG impact assessment that was published last year with Cambridge University Press has shown that the political impact of the 17 SDGs has so far largely been discursive. So we would like to discuss today with you where you see these changes take, uh, taking place and under what conditions these developments can actually be accelerated to achieve um, yeah, transformative change until 2030 and beyond. So we're also interested in hearing from you any enabling or constraining factors you see. And uh, this is of course very relevant at this critical midterm juncture that we're in also in the lead up to the SDG summit in September. So we're very happy to open this round table with a first input from Pamela Chesek um, on where she sees change taking place in global governance and how this can be accelerated. Pamela, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Felicitas. And welcome everybody. Since I'm going first, I can, I sort of have the advantage that I can say anything and I apologize if I'm stealing any of the um, ideas that anybody else will be presenting later. And I'm, I'm going to, um, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be familiar, but let me, I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> At the halfway point, the achievement of the SDGs is much more challenging than was really envisioned in 2015. Although the SDGs were assumed to be aspirational goals, and no one was really expecting the accomplishment of all the SDGs and targets, there have been a number of contributing factors to the lower than expected implementation. The first four are well known, but they're worth repeating. But all of these factors follow a common theme, and that's what I want to sort of draw your attention to. And this is the lack of public attention to the SDGs. Some of this is the fault of policymakers. Some of this is on the media. Some of this is on education. Um, so as I mentioned them, think of this lack of attention. And I tend to put these all in this metaphor of when you take your dog for a walk, as you're trying to get to your destination, which is in this case, SDG implementation by 2030, the dog's attention shifts with each new smell along the way. And I feel that that's what the multilateral system has been faced with over the past number of years. The first obviously is the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've seen the impact of the pandemic on health, global economy, education, probably every single SDG and every single factor. 
uh, particularly with regard to the increase in poverty. And COVID naturally drew everyone's attention away from the SDGs into dealing with the pandemic at hand. The second one is um, conflict. And the illegal Russian invasion of Ukraine exacerbated food, energy, humanitarian, and refugee crises around the world. However, well, according well, to- Excuse me. Um, um, but according to the 2022 SDG report, the world is experiencing the largest number of violent conflicts since 1946. And more than a quarter of the world's population lives in a country affected by conflict. So it is very easy to lose any focus on the SDGs when you're dealing with day-to-day -day survival. Climate change is a third one. Um, the immediacy of the climate crisis is, um, has overshadowed everything. Increasing heat waves, droughts, wildfires, floods are already affecting billions of people around the globe and causing potentially irreversible damage to the Earth's ecosystems. And the rise, rising attention of climate change, even though, mind you, all these issues are part of the SDGs, they draw attention away from that, you know, this is part of the SDGs. And we're looking at the climate crisis, not SDG 13. Um, on the multilateral sustainable development agenda, we are also facing multiple smells, if we want to use the dog metaphor. Um, with each new MEA meeting or each new negotiation, attention of policymakers, NGOs, and others shifts to the newest thing on the agenda. So the plastics negotiations are getting a lot of attention. Oceans, uh, from seabed mining to the BB&J negotiations. Biodiversity last year with the adoption of the new global biodiversity framework. Um, chemicals, climate, et cetera. All of these shifts focus away from the SDGs, even though everything is really linked. Um, but we don't effectively see these links in other multilateral fora. Um, sometimes it's lip service, sometimes it's not mentioned at all. And that's another thing I think that has contributed to this, but also provides an opportunity um, in the future. Um, a recent OECD report reported on multilateralism and notes that multilateral, the multilateral system in general is facing or confronting three paradoxes. Um, and that also links back, I believe, to SDG implementation. First, the multilateral system has never been as much demand as it is today, but neither has it faced much criticism. And the cr criticism we see at the UN agenda, at the UN system as a whole, trickles down to criticism towards the SDGs or lack of attention on the SDGs. Um, another paradox is that even though we've seen an increasing amount of official development assistance channeled through multilateral organizations, the resources fall short. And we see this most definitely with regard to SDG implementation. And finally, while the need to reform the system has never been as pressing, the multilateral system is architecture is more crowded. And that's drawing attention away from the SDGs. There's new multilateral funds that keep appearing. Um, there's new threats. Um, there's greater expansion and greater fragmentation. And so I think all of these issues are competing with attention on the system for the SDGs. And if I still have, do I have one more? I haven't lost, I've lost track of time. Do I have another minute? Um, so a couple of things, how, where do we see opportunities for moving forward and getting the SDGs the attention they need at all levels? Um, and, you know, some of this is we need renewed media attention and it's very hard in this media landscape to get that attention. Um, we need more educational materials. Um, some countries, Japan in particular, have, you know, most people in Japan know about the SDGs. Most people in the United States do not. So how do you get more educational material out there? How do you, you know, educate children on up about this and raise that attention? Um, the scientific community 
sees that we need more evidence-based, scientifically sound policies, and how can we get greater attention from government in terms of funding and working with scientists to do the research that is necessary to address the SDGs. And finally, my last point is the SDGs themselves have become fragmented. This is supposed to be a universal integrated agenda. And even in the way that the, H, the high level political forum and other bodies are addressing them, our, our SDG by SDG, not recognizing that looking at, oh, how are we going to accomplish one of these SDGs has ripple effects on all the SDGs. And that we need to resume this integrated agenda, break down the fragmentation that we're seeing across the multilateral system. And maybe that can bring us closer to where we need to get by 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very interesting input, also particularly highlighting the role of education, attention, communication, um, very interesting factors. Next, we're very excited to hear from Mariana Beisheim, where she, she sees change taking place and how this could be accelerated. Thank you, Felicitas. Um, I guess with the upcoming SDG Summit in September, we are all trying to, you know, um, make up our mind where we are in this mid midtime moment and how do we can do better. So uh, I, I used the preparations for this roundtable to make up my mind and to make up my story. And here it is. It has basically three parts. The starting point, then the second one, how I see the current debates at the United Nations when it comes to global governance and the HLPF as this is the title of this session. And then the third part, what are the lessons that I draw from all this? The starting point um, to take up uh, the title of, of your roundtable series is the promises and pitfalls of this global governance model of governing through goals. So back in 2015, when the SDGs and the 2030 agenda has been negotiated, it defined the goals and the targets, right? Um, including some, if we are honest, some ambiguous wording and also trade-offs between the goals and targets. And this was in fact necessary for closing the package deal. And we also have the 2030 agenda principles that indicate or give us some guidance on how to implement. Uh, you know, we need to be transformative. This is a universal agenda. <clears throat> it's supposed to be integrated. In fact, it is not, as Jim Pam just pointed out. Um, policies need to be coherent, and we need to approach all this in a coherent and participatory manner, leaving no one behind. But exactly how to implement, so through what policies and measures at the time, was left deliberately open. Um, because Again, this was necessary for closing the deal because member states tend to reject any in in intervention in their national development priorities and strategies. And if you read through the 2030 agenda, you often find this formula that we uh, that member states want others to respect national policies and priorities. So instead of being too strict uh, defining policies and measures, uh, member states wanted to use the high level political forum on sustainable development and do uh, the voluntary national reviews and through this learn from each other how to best implement the SDGs. But this peer learning so far through these voluntary national reviews was good for localizing the SDGs. Member states explained how they try to um, localize and implement, but it did not yet, in my view, really deliver on how to achieve transformation and now also acceleration. So the strategy for crafting a global consensus governing through goals is now somehow, in my view, backfiring when the SDG progress review shows us that we need more speed and scope, and therefore the UN Secretariat is now calling for member states to bring forward the so-called high impact initiatives 
during the SDG summit in September. But honestly, I don't yet see it coming. Uh, I don't see it yet in the political declaration, in, in the elements paper, and I don't see it in, in any national papers that I have seen so far. So second, I ask, is there a political will to change and improve the global governance and the HLPF uh, in order to, to get to this, to go for accelerated SDG implementation? Now, Felicitas and I, we researched the 2021 review of the HLPF, the negotiations, the intergovernmental negotiations um, for strengthening the HLPF. But in fact, back then, member states in 2021 didn't want to harden, as they put it, the voluntary national reviews. There were also only some minor changes like uh, acknowledging the role of voluntary local reviews. And, and actually there is some momentum in these local reviews and the local actors coming in more and more. But again, basically a major reform was blocked because member states tend to reject any intervention in their national development priorities and strategies. Now, since 2021, member states and civil society groups started to debate the UN Secretary General's report, Our Common Agenda. And this report resulted in a process towards the 2024 Summit of the Future. And maybe you have seen last week, the UNSG's uh, the Secretary General's high-level advisory panel on effective multilateralism published their report. The title of this report is A Breakthrough for People and Planet. And they discuss six transformative shifts in their report. And the UN Secretariat presents this report and all these discussions is yet another opportunity to discuss how to turbocharge the implementation of the SDGs. And I think in fact, this could be true as for example, the report, um, the uh, Our Common Agenda report and also so-called HLAP report, the High Level Advisory Panels report discuss how to reform the financial architecture, the global financial architecture, how to go beyond GDP as a yardstick, how to use digital innovation and governance as a lever, how to better deal with these shocks that Pam mentioned, like COVID or now the cost of living crises, and how to integrate more long-term thinking and decision-making. But then again, if you read it in the news today, yesterday's debate in the Security Council on effective multilateralism illustrates the deep geopolitical divides between countries. There's really no trust and no common understanding of multilateralism. And so also the consultations on the summit of the future have been disappointing so far. There may be some momentum for bringing about reform, but it's so far rather a silent majority that might want this to happen. So how about political will of member states? Because often we read in the UN textbooks, the UN can only do what member states allow them or agree uh, on doing. Um, here at SWP, we are currently drafting a study on this and the 11 colleagues who are regional experts uh, who write studies on the implementation of the SDGs in their countries draw a rather sobering picture. They show that a lack of good governance and also state capture hamper meaningful implementation of the SDGs. Instead, elite interests are in the fore. For example, we see large infrastructure legacy projects instead of pro-poor projects with a focus on the development needs of marginalized groups. So what are the lessons? I know I have to wrap up. We always say political will is crucial, both at global and national level. But being a political scientist, I think we need to do more work on unpacking that term. And only then will we be able to answer the question, how could the SDG summit bring member states to critically review and revise their existing implementation strategies? And what could motivate heads of state and government to go for acceleration? Is it access to finance, as they often say, and uh, the SG has um, suggested a, an SDG stimulus package, or is that rather a necessary but not a sufficient condition for acceleration and um, 
how can we, you know, create and generate the high level political will to bring about the transformation and I'm looking forward to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne, for reminding us of the critical role of political will and maybe unpacking that further. Um, sounds like a very good way forward. Uh, next, I would like to give the floor to Maya Buches, uh, and we're excited to hear from you where you saw in your research change taking place amongst international organizations and how you think this could be accelerated. Yes, thank you, Felicitas. So, um, as Felicitas mentioned, uh, I did my PhD research over the past four years, mainly on international organizations and the SDG, so I'll speak of that because that is what I know. Um, but what I want to talk about actually builds quite well on what we just heard from Pam and Mariam already. So what I mainly found is, is three things. So I looked at the uptake of the SDGs at the international level and how often are they used. I looked at um, uh, interaction patterns, collaborative patterns, and I looked at the integration of the different SDG issue areas. And as I said, it's what I found is, is, is quite similar to what was just mentioned. So one thing I see is that the SDGs are being used more and more, but uh, it's not really leading to anything much in terms of policy integration or increased collaboration. So um, as Pam said, indeed, there might need to be more attention for the SDGs also at the international level before you can actually start seeing some of these effects. Um, Another one of the things I found is that uh, we see more and more siloed forms of collaboration. So one of the things with the SDGs is that they're intended to overcome silos and make sure that we come up with integrated approaches. But at the same, the same time, the design of the goals is very much still sectoral. And so um, it, it could be that having such sectoral goals actually reinforces these uh, sectoral collaborations where people think, okay, you know, I'm going to work on SCG8 and let's work together with other people that work on SCG8. Um, and yeah, to sort of overcome that, I'm not sure if the SDGs in their current form are the right tool for that. And then a, a third point is that I looked at the how the SCG issue areas are integrated in terms of topic and to what extent there's more attention for certain links. Um, and here, it's also, again, not completely surprising that some SDGs are very heavily prioritized at the international level. So these are mainly the economic ones. Also, uh, the partnerships is very often mentioned. Everyone loves to collaborate. Uh, and there are also a few goals that are really, really left behind. And it's not surprising. We see uh, the, the goal for land, the goal for oceans, uh, and also the goal for inequality that aren't really mentioned that much topically, but also not really connected to many of the other issues. So these are really like sort of out of, out of sight, out of mind, I almost could say. Um, and so what, what can we sort of do to overcome that, yeah, I, I, of course, this is the million dollar question. <laughs> um, and so some of the things I have been thinking about is to make maybe a push to collaborate more across policy domains. So in the SDGs, there is, for example, a partnership goal for cross-sectoral partnerships, but their sectors are more defined as like academia, business, et cetera, which is also fine. Like I don't wanna change anything about that. But uh, having more attention for collaborations between uh, organizations working in different issue areas might be a good starting point to increase such integrated approaches. And then another option, um, of course, we know that there is no hard prioritization really possible in the SDGs, at least uh, as Mariana was saying, it's sort of a consensus framework and it's quite hard to really say, okay, we really need to focus on this now but we may want to think about soft forms of prioritization. Uh, for example, if we see that one goal really is falling far, far, far behind, maybe we should agree that there's a certain threshold where we start shifting focus a little bit. Um, this could be an option, but uh, how to concretely implement that is of course the next step and how to actually determine the thresholds or uh, uh, who gets to decide those thresholds is also a big question. Um, we can also think of the HLPF. This was already mentioned that it's also quite a sectoral approach. They look at specific SDGs each time. Um, perhaps there's more room there to also look at uh, links between the different SDGs because there's much to be done also in terms of elucidating how the different SDGs do actually work together uh, and where there are synergies and trade-offs. So perhaps the HLPF can play a role there. 
Um, yeah, and finally, to continue a bit on this idea of that the SDGs are a global consensus, that they may, uh, that there's different ideas there on what sustainable development entails. And these ideas are sort of, they're not really solved or discussed with the SDGs. And so here I have a little bit of a worry that if we have the SDGs and it looks like everything is integrated and combinable, but it really isn't, does that then stifle discussions on where our priorities should be? Um, so perhaps having more discussion on that and what sort of the underlying ideas are uh, could also be a step forward. And I, I keep it at that, I keep it short. Perfect, thank you very much, Maya, for very interesting thoughts also on the siloed implementation of the SDGs so far. Um, next, we are happy to hear from Samya Yoshi on um, where she sees change taking place uh, with, on the theme of uh, emerging technologies and how things could be accelerated in this area. Thanks, Felicitas. And uh, one of the benefits of coming in last is also that uh, uh, much has already been said and in, and in a very good way. So I will not repeat. Um, rather, I'll keep it really brief and augment on the emerging technology side, which is what I've been asked to speak about. So where we see ourselves today at this juncture is a very interesting place where we see uh, existential risk, both in terms of what we are faced with in terms of the climate, biodiversity loss, but also in terms of what technologies such as AI are presenting us with. Um, when we talk about acceleration of sustainable transformations, what we're seeing in the field of emerging technologies is a different kind of acceleration, which is impacting the SDG goals and, and the targets. What I wanted to present today in this very brief intervention is um, a balanced view that shows both the enabling and constraining factors. If we look at the enabling ones first, um, as many of you might already be aware, um, the introduction of AI in the field of sustainability has um, helped us go through vast amounts of data when it comes to Earth systems governance and help us um, or enable us to get a better grip on measurements, optimization, um, understanding and linking models, uh, even understanding the trade-offs and synergies between the SDG goals themselves. So um, looking at national level implementation, where are we going ahead, where are we not? The constraining factors, and this is was covered, I think also what, by what Maya just mentioned on the inequality goals, specifically SDG 10, the, there is a huge uh, disruption that these technologies are causing in the field of equity. Uh, when we talk about leaving no one behind, um, AI and AI models, and this is reflected in many of what we consider emerging technologies, there is a massive footprint, not just of um, where uh, the power lies in terms of um, uh, constructing uh, the data sets, gathering data, processing powers, computational powers, where the knowledge sits, but also the distribution of risks and rewards today globally are hugely um, inequitable. Um, there is also the aspect of ghost labor in terms of how AI models are um, labeled and categorized, but also then in the application area of emerging technologies, AI is currently being used in the field of oil and gas explore, exploration, finding new sites for it. There is the bias, algorithmic bias and misinformation element, which sort of takes us back in terms of pulls us away from the SDG goal implementation. And there is the tension, classic tension, I would say, between sufficiency and efficiency models. So whereas many of the emerging tech models are trained on optimization of both resource use uh, and um, extraction. Um, this is in stark contrast with many of the SDG goals. So where this leaves us, if we were to take a step back and say, uh, if we are looking at how to accelerate the realization of sustainable transformations in, in the years till 2030 that we have, um, one thing that I felt and also has been resonated in what the other speakers have said so far is that the voluntary nature of the governance 
both when it comes to the implementation of SDGs, but also in terms of global governance of vast technological systems like AI. Uh, the very fact that it's left to the voluntary nature of nations setting the agenda has resulted in this sort of weaker implementation or us not putting certain guardrails in place and uh, in, in the development of such technologies. Um, while there might be some inherent constraints, as the, you know, Marianne mentioned as well, about how nations respond to a more sort of top-down or regulatory approach to this, um, there have been suggestions uh, proposed solutions of creating um, governance bodies that go across or cut across sectors, like what Maya, Maya spoke about, um, not looking at them as silos, so bringing in expertise from diverse areas, uh, but also across nations, so representing global north and south interests. Um, exposing some of the contradictions that are inherent in the global governance goals also. So for example, um, the classic dilemmas we face when we are looking at um, industrial, uh, green industrial transitions, where there is a huge uh, emphasis on technology transfer and uh, cutting down emissions, but perhaps less so on the just transitions or the livelihood questions baked therein. So I just wanted to end by highlighting that um, emerging technologies such as AI uh, can play a great catalyst role in, in, in this transformation, and it is in many ways in terms of just the sheer capacity we have to understand the data, to, to highlight the gaps, to, to process that. But, uh, but it must not be left unsaid that the inequity dimensions and the sort of disruptions that these technologies cause um, um, can pull us back even further if they're not paid attention to. So I will stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much uh, for this input. Very interesting. And I also think it's great to see some common themes uh, coming through. Um, now I hand over the floor to David O'Connor, who has the difficult task to speak as the last person. Um, and we're interested to hear also from you what shifts you see in global governance and um, how these could be accelerated to achieve transformation. There will be a slide that should be put up for you as well. Uh, we can wait a couple of minutes and there it's coming. Thanks very much. Thank you, Felicitas. Can everybody hear me? I'd like to thank the previous speakers. Um, and I'll just quickly run through this because I know there's not much time. Um, I wanted to come directly to Marianne Beisheim's uh, last, the third point about unpacking political will, because uh, I think that's crucial. Uh, and I'd like to emphasize that what we need to identify now are the leverage points for acceleration of progress. And I'm not talking about the leverage points in the uh, GSDR of 2019. I'm talking about where do the key decisions get made which can actually unlock progress? And what does unlocking progress mean? I would like to suggest that yes, finance is a crucial part of it. Whether it's a sufficient condition, probably not because it has to be managed well, it has to be used well. It's not just a, a magic bullet, but that is a crucial question at this point in time. And so that brings me to the first of these four points that I just, these shifts that I wanted to mention from a unipolar to a multipolar global governance framework. What I mean here is that um, before the financial crisis, basically the United Nations ruled in terms of global governance. Okay, yes, you had the, the MDBs and so on, and, and they still are very important. But after the financial crisis, you had the emergence of a, a competing power center, decision-making center, and that is the G20. And so it's, it's suggestive to me that when the Secretary General calls for a 500 billion stimulus package for the SDGs, he directs that request to the G20. <laughs> Why? Because they have some power to make that happen. And how do they make that happen? Because they have tremendous influence over the major institutions, over finance uh, in the international financial system, including the multilateral uh financial institutions. Um, so I would just, you know, maybe maybe not go into great 
depth on this, but I would just like to flag one important development and suggest that this needs to be brought to some kind of a closure at the SDG summit in September, if at all possible. And if not in September of this year, then definitely by the summit of the future next year. And that is um, a major opening up of new financial flows through the multilateral development banks, but not only, including leveraging at multiples of what is currently happening, private finance, financial flows for the SDGs. And as you may already know, a number of the key shareholders in those in the in the World Bank have insisted that the World Bank develop a roadmap for reforming, for reforming its model of operations, its financial model, and so on, precisely to direct more funding to the SDGs and to the global public goods, which are integral to achieving the SDGs. So in a way, what has happened in Germany and, and the United States are key actors in this, as you may know, what has happened is that Paula Caballero's uh, insight in the negotiations up to Rio plus 20 and beyond on the fact that these global public goods, if they're not adequately provided, like protection of the global climate system, will undermine progress on sustainable development, on the SDGs, on poverty eradication and hunger and so on, that has finally made its way into the key institutions which can unlock the capital which is needed to make for accelerated progress towards the SDGs. Okay, uh, one last point, because I think I'm already running out of time. Um, from large blocks to variegated alliances, from consensus-based decision-making to coalitions of like-minded countries. Yes, you know, the G77 and EU and, and the big blocks are very useful for reaching consensus on big things, on aspirational statements like the SDGs. And they're not very good at making action happen on the ground. And so to actually make things happen, to accelerate progress, countries have, I think, begun to say, OK, let's look at where we can get a group of like minded, critical countries together to make change happen. And one example that I'd like to cite is the creation of the Just Energy Transition Partnership, which was launched at the Sharm el Sheikh COP of the Climate Change Negotiations uh, Convention uh, last year, where you have not just a bunch of important countries, but influential countries, countries which can set examples for others coming on board with developed countries providing a commitment of financing in exchange for a commitment by their partners to phase to use the funding to fight to phase out coal-fired power generation and a transition away from fossil fuel-based energy. So you have Indonesia there, you have South Africa, you have Vietnam. Of course, you don't have China and India, but still you have important countries. And so moving to this kind of coalition, I think, of like-minded countries uh, can, can be an important step. But that said, I'd just like to make one final point, which is that um, in terms of building coalitions, it's very important at the national level and the local level to do the hard work of con consultation, of, of garnering consensus and compensating losers. So for example, in the case of uh, the, the energy transition, climate change, uh, you have a contrast between this sort of top-down approach, which was followed, I would argue, in France with the, uh, you know, the tax on, on fuels and the strong reaction from the public, a segment of the public to that, versus the, the German approach of building a co consensus, a coalition, obviously with, with differences and with pushback, but with a final agreement on the phase out of coal uh, over a period of time in Germany. That hard work has to happen. The problem, of course, is that that consensus building takes time and we don't have much time. So reconciling that is going to be the big challenge. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for these very crucial points also on financing and how to go forward in with more coalitions. Um, Thanks, everybody, for all the speakers for giving very inspirational and thought provoking points. Um, I think we have a good basis for a discussion, and I will now hand over to Melanie uh, to guide the discussion. Yeah, thanks for um, all your interventions. Um, I do not yet see many questions in the chat, but feel free to ask them and 
Um, yeah, if you want, you can also raise your hand and ask the question directly, but I'm also not seeing any hands. So maybe I can just open uh, the, the question uh, box with a question to Pam. So you had this great uh, story about, yeah, um, people actually being a distracted dog in the sense uh, that many things come along and move us away from looking at the SDG. So how can we actually keep the attention of the dog? So you mentioned that means might be media or education, but then again, also Mariana mentioned, of course, the concept of political will. So it seems to be kind of a chicken and egg situation. So maybe you can share some of your yeah, ideas on that. Um, I agree with your, your sense that this is a chicken and egg situation, very much so. Um, but what I think um, could be useful is I believe there's actually a lot going on out there that shows the SDGs are being implemented, but they're not being linked to the SDGs. And so I think everything, everything that we've recognized due to the COVID-19 pandemic with regard to the inaccessibility to healthcare, the shortages and problems confronting our public health systems across the world are all things that are helping to make us come to the realization of what we need to do with regard to um, health issues in the SDGs and recognizing also the links to education, the links to inequality um, and various other issues. And it's all part of the SDG agenda, but we don't hear it being discussed as part of the SDG agenda. And that goes back to what many people have noted with regard to the lack of linkages that have been made. And um, and this is part and par parcel the problem of the HLPF as well, which I'm sure Marianne could um, to could discuss as well. So how, you know, and goes back also to the fact that our government still remains siloed and that as does the international system. So I think what we need to do is to look a little more carefully at what is being done. And this requires a lot of work and governments are maybe not up to it, but that there's more being done on the SDGs than perhaps we know, but they're just not being labeled as such. So maybe that's one direction we can take is to sort of look at another approach rather than looking for SDGs, um, looking for the topics of the SDGs and looking for how this is being, these issues are being addressed um, both at the global level as well as at the national level, um, you know, sort of turning it upside down. It's not an easy solution, but I don't think we have any easy solutions. But that's just a thought. Yeah, so you, um, maybe I could say like celebrating the successes more. That could be a way to say it. So that brings me immediately in my mind to the idea of the VNRs, right? So much of the critique on the VNRs is actually that countries, you know, are often kind of celebrating their, um, positive activities and not too much reflecting on where actual challenges are. And I think it's interesting um, to note that in some other negotiation um, lines, so I think they did this in the biodiversity negotiations, they're actually also using this idea of uh, voluntary reporting, kind of modeling it on the SDG VNR um, approach. So maybe, um, yeah, Mariana, maybe you can reflect a bit on how uh, good of a development you think it is that the VNR approach, so to say, is kind of maybe becoming a recurring, um, yeah, recurring mode of um, reporting for so for global goals, so to say. Yeah, thank you. I already said that I think uh, it's better than we expected in the beginning. Um, the VNRs also have improved over time and, and many more countries voluntarily reported than we had hoped for. So in, in terms of numbers, it's a success and also the quality improved, but still it's a very weak um, mechanism. 
not only because it's lacking teeth, but also because member states do not invest enough, as David put it, hard work into this, really, you know, evaluating what they have been doing in terms of policies and measures and whether they delivered in a transformative way. And, and this is really what we needed. Also, um, Pam and um, Maya have been pointing out we need more integrated action. But also, I think we need to learn how to do this in an effective and efficient way, because right now, for example, in Germany, we have these um, transformation teams that have been set up across the ministries, the line ministries, and it's such a tedious process, and it takes so much time that we do not have, as David pointed out. So how to actually go forward in an integrated way is also something that we need to learn. And, and so I think investment in how to, you know, best make the best out of these processes and how to also make the best of the money that we might see out there in the market um, is definitely needed. Yeah, so um, maybe we can uh, move to uh, Maya um, now, because of course, you know, Mariana and um, I think Pam also um, kind of referred to um, your call for more um, cross-sectoral collaboration. So are there any um, concrete yeah, pathways uh, in your case, of course, you know, at the international level that you can imagine would yeah, really help to accelerate implementation in this case. That is a really good question. Um, so, of course, I've been working on this for the SDGs and before my PhD, I was working a bit on the innovation policy in the Netherlands, which took a pretty similar approach. They called them top sectors and those were the sectors where we had to really push. And you kind of saw the same effects that their sort of silos of collaboration came more and more into existence because you had these very sectoral, um, they were called the innovation intermediaries and they were linked to some subsidies. Um, so I guess in a way, this sectoral domain specific way of setting goals doesn't help. So then another way to think about it is to maybe um set more goals that unite certain areas or set goals that are perhaps less sector specific and more like moonshots we've heard about um and i'm not sure to what extent this would function well or that that would really create cross-sectoral partnerships but to really increase this focus on no it's not just one domain that we need to work on but it really is integrated and one very simple thing that might help is to simply think of other ways of visualizing the SDGs, because in the communication, there are almost always 17 separate blocks. And uh, it, it could be as simple as redesigning a bit uh, to get people's attention to focus more on, no, they're not blocks, they're a, a network or a, a spider web or whatever way we want to formulate it. So that would be, might be one thing that is at least implementable in the next years to come. Yeah, so maybe I can also kind of um, move a related question to uh, David O'Connor. So do you see a way in which, because you talked about financing, you talked about multilateral development banks, and there are a lot of new financial instruments being promoted. Um, do you see any that, yeah, kind of really focus on this cross-sectoral uh, way of accelerating? Do you see that, yeah, increasing? Um, Uh, thanks, Melanie. Um, well, I suppose one could argue that the um, proposal, it's still at this stage, not yet reality, to make the World Bank, which is by far and away the largest of the multilateral banks, although others are important, um, more responsive to global threats, global challenges not just climate change, but other others, pandemic preparedness, et cetera, um, that that itself is thinking in cross-cutting terms because climate change is clearly impacting on food security, on poverty eradication, on, on, on these other areas. So through that lens, it may be that you'll have a more integrated 
approach uh, being implemented. But um, another important thing I'd just like to mention about the proposed reforms of the, um, the World Bank is that um, one element is the increase in concessional finance uh, available. And that goes hand in hand with addressing global public goods because the argument is that developing countries aren't going to borrow at market or you know commercial rates to finance things which are benefiting the world. So they need to have some concessional uh, element of the financing. But that now is being discussed as not just for the IDA countries, the least developed countries, but also for all developing countries, for middle income countries. And I think that's an important step forward because it comes to the discussion on beyond GDP, which has been about, well, we're all vulnerable in different ways. It's not just the least developed countries. Countries which have high measured GDP may also be vulnerable and need concessional finance to address those vulnerabilities. And so this proposed reform, even though it doesn't talk about that, is in a way addressing that concern of many middle income to lower middle income developing countries. I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, uh, we're, we're slowly running out of time, but I wouldn't uh, li like to close the session without also asking uh, Somia Yoshi a question. So um, what do you think you talked about some potentials, but also some challenges of emerging technology and also AI uh, for the SDGs? But what do you think could be like a concrete example of something that these emerging technologies might do um, to really help the acceleration of the um, SDGs in your experience? I think that's a good question. It's um, the focus tends to be more on the kind of negative aspects. So uh, rather to flip that around and say, where could this actually help? Um, as I mentioned, uh, SDGs, um, there's been a lot of really good studies done around how emerging technologies like AI are helping us better understand the interlinkages between, let's say, the nationally determined contributions, where they're falling short, where are the gaps, and likewise, where are the uh, trade-offs and synergies. So in terms of the mapping, um, looking at an integrated assessment in that it is a huge benefit to us. Um, when it comes to implementation, um, again, AI as a sort of emerging technology um, is showing immense potential in the field of um, energy, in the field of new materials um, and innovations that can actually help us um, avoid many of the sort of fossil fuel dependent pathways we're currently on even when we talk about uh, a hard to abate sectors in the industries going towards green transitions. Um, all of this, I would say with a caveat. So there is, it's very important to really keep in mind that um, like any technology, so AI is not unique in that sense. We have to think about um, the underlying architecture, what it's being trained on, what what it, what are the sort of parameters and values it's mirroring. So um, some of the realizations of the SDG goals, like the ones I mentioned, number 10 and leaving no one behind and the more equity related goals, um, these are not being mirrored very well in the current um, architectures. So um, it's a very important moment in time for us to be mindful about this. So the same sort of challenges we're facing in the global governance of, the, of um, these goals is exactly the same we're facing in the technology area. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I would have loved to continue our discussion. I think there's a lot of potential for uh, a, a continuing this conversation, but unfortunately we're out of time. I do want to mention before we uh, leave, well, first of all, thanks for all the interventions and the experts that agreed to be part of this virtual roundtable, uh, uh, but also that this uh, virtual roundtable will be the first of a larger series of roundtables, uh, the next of which we will hopefully soon, uh, yeah, let you know the date and topic of. Uh, we hope to see you there, but. Also, for those interested working on SDG research, it's also possible uh, for you to join the ESG task force on the SDGs. We're part of the global governance working group, but there are a number of 
other working groups focused on different subtopics and the SDGs. So please feel free um, if you're interested to uh, look up our task force and to um, email us if you're interested in joining. And uh, for now, I want to thank you all very much for participating and hope to see you again at the next virtual roundtable. Thank you. Thank you for hosting, Melanie Felicitas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank Ciao. you.